I have the great, great pleasure to introduce Elke Weber and Eric Johnson. Elke, Eric, please come on stage. They're both professors at the business school at Columbia Not University in New York. Eric is in the area of consumer behavior and Elke is in management. They founded and they both co-direct the Center for Decision Sciences, so research about all kinds of decisions. And Elke is a world-known expert on environmental decisions. She has worked with organizations such as the United Nations and the World Bank. And Eric has done fundamental work in the area of choice architecture, something he will talk about and explain in a minute. And he's worked in how to apply the behavioral sciences to public policy in health and in consumer finance. Eric and Elke, it's so great that you're here. The stage is yours. Thank you so much, Isabel, for your kind introduction. We are honored and delighted to start off the second day of DL Day Women with you. I will talk about how people make decisions in situations that influence our health, wealth, and happiness. As you heard just before, this man, Mick Jagger, sang you one of my favorite songs, You Can't Always Get What You Want. And obviously by the picture, he's gotten a lot of what he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> he's even now Sir Mick Jagger, he's been knighted. And Elke and I think that this is close, but not exactly right. What he should have been singing is, you don't always know what you want. As opposed to the world we were handed by economists, where everyone knows the price of everything, knows exactly what will make us happy, we believe that people are often trying to predict what will make them happy. We call this, they're constructing their preferences, they're trying to figure out what they want on the fly. Or well, instead of saying that we don't know what we want, we could also argue that we want too many things. Yeah, we often want things that are mutually exclusive, like, for example, staying slim, uh, but also eating those tempting German desserts. <laughs> it's those conflicts that really define difficult decisions. And how we resolve the conflict and construct our preferences oftentimes changes over time. Let me illustrate this with the example Maria just talked about. We've all done exactly that. At 11 o'clock, we set the alarm to get up at 6, absolutely convinced we're going to pop out of bed and do 5K, right? Then when the alarm goes off, we change our mind. We hit this news alarm not once, nor what twice. We often turn the alarm off entirely. What is it about our psychology that makes us disconnect from 11 o'clock to the 6 o'clock? Well, when you're thinking about setting the alarm, what are you thinking about? Well, we're thinking about our slim cells, how much fun we'll have running. What happens when you think about it at six o'clock. Obviously, the pillow is very comfortable. The air out there is very cold. It's as if the person who's setting the alarm at 11 is not talking to the person who's thinking about what's happening at six. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, Ulysses, uh, or as the Germans say, Odysseus, had a great idea about how to prevent giving in to temptation. Uh, he anticipated that the siren song would lead him to steer his ship around the uh, rocks on the shore to get closer to the sirens. And to prevent that from happening, he had his crew tie him to the mast of his ship and then plug their ears with wax so they wouldn't subsequently hear his pleas to be released from the mast. What he effectively did was to remove the tempting choice option from his choice menu. Now, as an aside, that's very similar to mandating uh, women representation on corporate boards which effectively removes the easy, tempting option of not having women on the board from the choice set. Okay. Is, is there an alternative to actually tying ourselves to the mast? That would be a good thing. That's kind of hard to do all the time. So what, our, what we suggest is something called choice architecture. Choice architecture is the art of designing things, our choices, so that we choose a thing that is in our long-term best interest and we won't regret later. To use choice architecture, we really need to know how we construct our preferences. And so Eric and I will now share with you some results from our investigations, how people actually make decisions. We've written a series of papers on something we call query theory. Uh, query theory is a theory of how we argue implicitly and automatically with ourselves about what the best choice option is. Okay. Let me illustrate this by asking you a question. Imagine I had given you as we do many of our respondents, including in the scanner, the fMRI machine, 
we give you a hundred dollar gift certificate which you can use today at your favorite retail store okay i now ask you would you want to switch to another gift certificate which is 105 dollars but you can get it in four weeks okay how many of you would take this smaller sooner reward be honest most people say i want this immediate now thing <laughs> now this is very common, and by the way, the interest rate, if you thought about this as an investment, is about 55%. That's a huge rate of return. Now, let me change the frame, change the chart architecture just a little. Imagine instead, I had get started out by giving you the $105 four weeks from now gift certificate, and then said, do you want to switch to the $100 immediate certificate? Do many of you think you would change your mind? Most of you will actually, if you're like the people we ask, will stick with the 105 long-term gift certificate. What we've done is made you more patient just by changing the way we structure the question. Now, what's going on here? Well, in query theory terms, when I have the $100, I'm thinking about how much fun it is to go shopping, what I'll do with that great thing I'll buy right away. I'm actually having a lot of fun simulating go, you know, the experience. When I give you the $105 first, you're thinking about, gee, it'd be nice in four weeks to go shopping. It would be fun. And I don't think much more about that extra you know, z buzz I would get by the immediate reward. That $5 disappears. As you saw in this example, the really important fact is what option do we consider first? And that's the basic the fundamental result of query theory. The first choice option considered gets a huge advantage because we generate more arguments for it all other things being equal. And so therefore, the important question to answer is what factors determine which choice option gets considered first? And that's where choice architecture comes in. One important answer to that question is that choice defaults, the option that is already in place or the option that's recommended by some gets considered first. Okay, let me apply this to a question literally of life and death, organ donation. Um, transplanting a heart or a kidney saves lives. There's no question about it. And the tragedy is there are just not enough donors to go around. In Germany, I looked this up last night, there are 12,000 people on the waiting list, and there are only 2,800 donors last year. So there's a huge gap, a huge shortage. Dan Goldstein, my friend, and I, about 10 years ago, noticed something. Different European countries ask the question, do you want to be a donor, different ways. In some countries, Germany, like the US, you have to decide, you have to opt in to be a donor. Other countries, Austria, Sweden, you are actually a donor unless you choose not to be. Notice the choices are exactly the same, the only difference is the default. So we started looking at how many people had signed up to be donors in these countries. I'm gonna show you the rate of agreement first for the countries where you have to opt in. Okay, these are the orange bars. Now, for the countries where you have to opt out. There is no statistics necessary. It's a huge effect. It's one of the biggest effects I've ever seen. And so we've done subsequent research where we actually looked at, does this difference in agreement determine how many lives are saved? That is, are more organs transplanted in the blue countries than the orange countries? The answer is it's a huge effect. Up to 50% more organs are transplanted in the countries in blue than the countries in orange. Mm. Now, Eric talked about his favorite example uh, about choice defaults related to how we can save lives. I will tell you an example, my favorite example of how we can save the world. Uh, two years ago, I had the privilege of talking to His Holiness the Dalai Lama about how we can encourage more environmentally responsible behavior in the world. You probably know that he's a very spiritual and a very compassionate man, but you may not know that he's also an extremely rational man. So he was arguing that all we needed to encourage environmentally sustainable behavior was for people to have the information, to be aware of what needs to be done. And I was disagreeing, and I gave him the following example uh, as an argument for how we can measure the effect of awareness against choice architecture. Now, every year in the United States, there are tens of thousands of conferences, academic and corporate conferences, and typically, delegates choose their lunch options on the registration menu. Their meat options, there's a vegetarian option, and on average, the number of delegates who choose a vegetarian option is quite small. Uh, as you see, 5% yeah, for all conferences. There is an environmental organization, both practitioners and researchers, and they are extremely aware of both the personal and environmental negative effects of meat consumption. 
uh, in terms of personal health, cholesterol, but also in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And the question is, how does that awareness affect their choice of the vegetarian option? Now, as you can see, it's 17%. That's pretty good, a threefold increase. Uh, but the organizer of this conference, uh, Karen Erhard Martinez, in 2009, decided to pre-check on the registration form the vegetarian option, making it effectively the default option, uh, but of course one that's very easily changed by just one mouse click if you want the meat option. Now, what was the effect of that? Well, 80% of delegates now chose the vegetarian option, an effect that really dwarfs the effect of mere awareness. Let me show you one last example, and it's not, it's going to be an example of how choice architecture is more than just defaults. I want to change people's estimates of how long they're going to live. So what I want is your participation. Imagine that this is an important decision, which it is, because you need to know how long you live to do financial planning. You want to make sure you don't die and leave a lot of money on the table, or you don't want to run out of money before you die, so it's actually an important question. So here's, yeah, I know, organ donation, this is depressing stuff. <laughs> But I want to ask this side of the room, you get the happy question. <laughs> what age do you expect to live to? Okay, everyone think about that. This side of the room, sorry, you get the unhappy question. What age do you expect to die by? <laughs> okay. Now, we know from our research that you, the two halves of the room, are thinking about different things. You're thinking about miraculous medical cures more often. You're thinking about your Aunt Betsy who lived to 100. You're thinking about wonderful things. You, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're thinking about, well, I really don't eat right, I don't exercise enough, I might not last as long. Now, the interesting thing is when we ask people this question and then, and then just ask them how long you're going to live to, it makes a difference. What you think about makes a difference in your estimates. If you live to, you're going to be with us to your 85. In the die-by frame, 75 years old. There's a 10-year difference simply by changing a couple words in the question. One final word about choice architecture. You may get the feeling by now that it's somehow wrong to change the default you know, or to change the question wording uh, because that might interfere with your true preferences. But the really important thing to realize is that there is no neutral choice architecture. Every way a decision is presented to you influences the choice that you make. Uh, and uh, therefore, the goal of choice architecture applied to yourself or applied to others is to help people make decisions that they will not regret in the long run. Uh, so applying this to your own decisions judiciously might help you get what you want, but maybe most important, more importantly, will make you realize what you need. We'd like now Isabel to join us, and we'll chat. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, great introduction. We have time for uh, a few questions. And uh, the first one, I think, uh, given that we are at DLD, a conference that's concerned with uh, digitalization and the increase in data and information in the world, I would like to ask uh, our two decision experts, how is the um, great amount of data that uh, we are exposed to today going to affect our decision making today and tomorrow? What do you think? Well, we know that lots of CPUs are getting faster. You know, every three years, the CPU power doubles. There's one CPU that hasn't changed its power very much. That's the one that's between our ears. So the question then becomes is how do we match the ability to present more information with the ability to process that, which has not changed much. Mm -hmm. And this is where we think that things like choice architecture help a lot. Mm -hmm. The goal of good IT shouldn't be to present more data. Mm -hmm. the, good, the goal of good IT is to present people the data in a way that will help them make better decisions. Let me just give you a little example. Mm -hmm. Do you want to choose mutual funds from a menu of 5,000? You want to see the half dozen that are best for you. you know, a lot of the value of good design on websites mm -hmm. is actually presenting the right information that's customized to the person. So I think there's a real revolution, but it's not one about presenting more information. It's about digesting and presenting the right information. So we will actually be able to make better decisions? With good design. Okay. We could make worse decisions. Okay. Uh, then yesterday we already heard a lot about the ongoing discussions about men, women in the boardroom. Um, and there are also, when you, when you read the popular press, uh, theories that having more women uh, on corporate boards would in, in better the decision making of organizations. Maybe would organizations make a little less risk uh, taking, would make the organization more cooperative. 
I, um, you've done so much research on decision making and the differences between decision makers. What does the research say about this question? Do men and women differ in their decision making? And should organizations care? Das ist deine kleine Ehe. Okay. <laughs> I think Ursula von der Leyen said it well. It's not a question of who makes better decisions, but there's value in diversity to the extent that women make different decisions or make decisions differently. Mm -hmm. And there is some evidence that there are gender differences. Of course, there's just as much variation within each gender as there are between gender. Uh, but women uh, tend to have the ability to consider more than one thing at a time. That's related to, to hormones. Uh, and so therefore, they're more likely to actually consider work and life, okay. or national security, and data privacy. And there's research evidence. There's research that. evidence okay. for that. Uh, and there's also evidence that women tend to be less overconfident, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps less confident, but also less overconfident, and therefore make more prudent decisions in some contexts. Okay. So uh, what would this mean for uh, governments or from a policy perspective? So there are lots of places that I think government can actually improve decisions by using these kinds of principles. Mm -hmm. um, but let me start with the individual level. Yeah. And that is, imagine you want to save more money. How could you do this? It's tough because you're tempted to buy that nice new toy now and not yeah. save for your retirement. So one way of doing this is to actually, a little bit like Ulysses, commit yourself to savings in advance. You can actually do an automatic withdrawal that before you ever get the money in your pocket, it's in your savings account. It goes directly from your paycheck. There are firms that help you do this, both as employers, but also as just financial institutions. They want to get more money under management, so they make it very easy for you. And finally, governments have been doing this increasingly. Uh, in the US, we're now able to both have firms that automatically do deposit and automatically escalate, increase that deposit. So there's lots of ways that for people, for firms, and for governments to try and actually help people make better decisions. Mm -hmm. Can I maybe add a personal takeaway? Sure. I think that the personal takeaway from our presentation is that there's really more than one way to think about a decision or to think about a situation. And yeah, just maybe to bring this back to the conference, yeah, many of you probably saw the article in the Süddeutsche Zeitung on Freitag, how our organizer, Maria Futbenger, sort of talked about how she learned to think differently about the cognitive decline of her aging father. And you know, not so much thinking about the cognitive abilities that had been disappearing, but the ones that were still in place. And arguably that made her happier and probably her dad happier as well. So let's uh, get practical. Um, how can everyone in this room improve their decision making right now or right after the session? What's your, what's your advice? I, I think the key thing is to realize our preferences are constructed. That we're going to think something at time one and something else at time two, when the alarm is set and when the alarm goes off. The question is thinking hard about what of those two worlds is the one that you really want to live in. And then once you know that, you can talk about the principles like this and actually decide to which one is right and implement it. There's an alarm clock that actually will, when it rings, it starts running around the floor. <laughs> so you have to get out of bed and chase it. Now, it's sort of a silly example, but it's okay. an example of how the realization that our preferences change and resolving that conflict can help us be better people, or at least happier people. Mm -hmm. And if you could give um, one piece of advice to the German government to improve uh, government decision uh, making <laughs> and policy making. Um, Let's pretend uh, we are by ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and not being broadcast live and not being YouTube. Okay. Elke, this is yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one thing our research shows is that oftentimes we think first about the tempting options. You know, the, the options easy to implement, the options that will get us easy re-election yeah, in, in, in some context. And I think as a policymaker, as a politician, you have a responsibility not to do that, but think about the public benefit and the public uh, welfare in the long run. Uh, and one way to do that is to think about those alternatives first. Mm -hmm. okay. Let me add one thing, which is the thing about choice architecture is it's inexpensive. People spend hundreds of millions of dollars trying to encourage people through advertising to be organ donors. All you have to do to change the default is literally change two lines of HTML. That's a lot cheaper. And so often, choice architecture is a very cost-effective way of government to help. Mm -hmm. Good. Then um, we have time for a last question. We've uh, talked a lot about uh, applying your research to individuals, to organizations, and governments. But uh, how do you actually apply uh, your research in decision-making to yourselves? Um, 
you're not just doing research together, uh, you're also, as the audience might not have realized yet, you're also a married couple. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would like to know, how do you apply your decision research uh, to your lives and to your marriage? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the easy question. <laughs> well, let me see. If you remember, query theory describes the decisions uh, that you make for yourself as a process of arguing with yourself. And I think decision-making in a, in a married couple, or for that matter, in a working relationship like Maria and Steffi's, really is a process <laughs> of uh, constructively arguing with each other. <laughs> and who am I to disagree? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, Eric Elke, thank you so much. It, it was a pleasure having you here, sharing <laughs> your knowledge. Thank you.